We've all had that one friend or acquaintance who fell in love with the wrong person, someone that just isn't good for them, and everyone on the outside can see it except the person in the relationship. Whether their partner is a bum with no job or goals, or like in Ashley's case, it's someone with a very sketchy connection to drugs and organized crime. Of course, Ashley had no idea, but eventually, Ashley started to get a horrible feeling that something bad was going to happen to her. Through text messages and conversations with friends, somehow, Ashley foreshadowed her own death, all because she fell in love with the wrong person. Today's case is a tangled web of a case that involves so many different players, so many different names, all connected to Ashley, her boyfriend, or somebody in their outer circle. You might want to grab a notebook and a pen to keep track of this one because let me tell you, there are so many moving parts, so much going on, so many different people playing different roles all coming together to explain why Ashley Dale was murdered. With that being said, let's just jump right into the case. This is the story of Ashley Dale. 28-year-old Ashley Dale was born to her parents, Steve Dune and Julie Dale, and she had a stepfather named Rob Jones. She had two younger sisters and a little half-brother, and she lived with her family in Liverpool, England. Ashley was described by loved ones as beautiful, intelligent, charismatic, career-driven, and family-oriented. She was strong-willed and dedicated. When she put her mind to something, nothing could stop her from accomplishing it. However, when Ashley was a teenager, tragedy struck her family. Her little brother, Lewis, was murdered when he was only 16 years old. In November of 2015, Lewis, who was described as sweet and gentle, was walking down the Leeds-Liverpool Canal in Maryside. It was then that he was mistaken for a member of a rival gang by three gang members. It was literally because he had curly hair that was similar to the man that they were actually targeting. But either way, Lewis was shot at close range in the back with a shotgun, and he died as a result of his injuries. Thankfully, the people who killed him were later charged and arrested, and they are currently behind bars. But even through all of that tragedy, Ashley stayed strong and did what she needed to do to do well in her own life. She went to university, graduating in 2017 with a degree in environmental studies, going on to work as an environmental health officer with Nosley Council. Those who work with Ashley spoke very highly of her, saying that she was a very hard worker who was not afraid to get her hands dirty. Ashley was someone who clearly cared a lot about her appearance, but that did not stop her from getting down and dirty at work. Her mother once said, quote, We used to joke because obviously she started off in the waste side of things, the most glamorous person that you'd ever see, as you can see from all the photographs, and she took this job on in environmental health, going through bin bags and things like that. Ashley was known to love food. When her family would go out to eat, Ashley was usually the one to pick the restaurant because she knew all of the best places and she had the best taste. She was known to have a very active and thriving social life, getting along with pretty much anybody who crossed her path. She was busy pretty much all of the time, spending time with friends and loved ones as often as she could. She loved going out and to music festivals when she was in her early and mid-20s, but by the time she was 28, she started talking to her father about wanting to start a family and getting married someday. When she wasn't out with her friends, she was at home spending time with her family and her beloved dog, Darla. She's very, she was very career driven. Um, she knew what she wanted in life, shall we say. I think from a very early age, she kind of always knew what she wanted. Um, she actually had just been promoted in a, in a job. She was very excited about a new promotion. Um, and she just wanted to sort of, I'd say, settle down and have a normal life, for want of a better word, shall we say. Um, you know, as we've seen from all the photographs and stuff of her, and then she took this job on in the environmental health, going through bin bags and things like that. It was, <laughs> she was the most, you know, the job she did was 
the least type of job we thought she would ever go into. We had a very, very good mother and daughter relationship, we really did. We spoke every day on the phone. Most mornings I drink her or she drink me as we both start and work and that kind of continues as the day went on. You know, we'd either speak you know, via social media or we'd ring each other, we'd text, you know, whatever it was. The communication always went on throughout the day. At the time, Ashley was dating a man named Lee Harrison. We will talk more about Lee in just a few minutes, but Lee and Ashley had been dating for about five years, and at the time, Ashley sort of knew that Lee was not her forever person. She worked a stable nine-to-five job. She had her degree, while Lee sort of did whatever. He didn't have a job, yet he still made money. She never was actually sure of what he did, and her parents didn't necessarily approve of their relationship. Overall, he just wasn't the person that she saw herself marrying or having kids with, but she couldn't quite get herself to make that permanent break just yet, so the two stayed together for the time being. By June of 2022, 28-year-old Ashley and her boyfriend, Lee, attended the Glastonbury Festival together. The Glastonbury Festival is a five-day music festival located near Somerset, England. This is a huge and widely attended music festival with headliners like the Arctic Monkeys, Guns N' Roses, Lizzo, Lana Del Rey, and even Elton John playing sets. It should have been an amazing, fun time of listening to music and maybe drinking and partying and things like that. But for Ashley, it was a weekend of drama and fighting. Now, I am about to name a lot of different people involved in this case, many of whom have their street nicknames, so it gets even more confusing from there. So for the sake of keeping things straight, I'm going to refer to everybody by their first name, their birth name, but if there are any certain quotes with the nicknames or any clips that I show and people talking about different individuals using their nicknames, I will try to remind you of who is being spoken of. So Lee Harrison, whose nickname was Saz, was known to run around with a group of gangsters known as the Hillsiders. About three years prior, the Hillsiders once stole drugs from an old friend of Lee's, Niall Berry, who went by Branch. At that time, it was said that Lee sided with the Hillsiders, and obviously that angered Niall because the two had been friends for a little bit before that, but it seemed like things calmed down and they remained acquaintances after this whole thing happened. However, at the festival, one of Niall's friends, Sean Zeese, who went by Zest, was attacked by another member of the Hillsiders, a man named Jordan Thompson, who was a friend of Lee's. After the attack, Sean's girlfriend, Olivia McDowell, who went by Liv, she had split off from Sean and started hanging out with Lee and Ashley. According to witnesses, the attack on Sean left him humiliated and even more humiliated that Liv went to hang out with the friends of the man who attacked him. So I know this is a bit confusing, it's a lot of names, but it appears that all of the men that I just mentioned were a part of the same wider circle of friends, but Niall and Sean ran with a different crowd of gangsters than Lee did. I know that at least Lee and Niall hadn't spoken in a few years before running into each other at the festival, but they had been pretty close friends at one point before the robbery. I don't know if Lee was a part of the Hillsiders, but he seemed to at least be friends with a lot of people from that gang. And then I will talk more about Sean later in the video, but he is also known to have a short temper and to not handle situations very well. Either way, at the festival, after Liv chose to hang out more with Ashley and Lee, Again, Sean, her boyfriend, got really upset, and according to witnesses, he was pretty much in a fit of rage. So, Ashley spent a lot of time at the festival just comforting Liv through all of it. It was also at that time that, according to witnesses, Niall had pulled out a big knife at the festival and was asking people where Lee was because he was going to stab him up. After the festival, we later get a look into what Ashley's life was like and what she was dealing with based on text messages, notes she made, and voice messages that she kept for herself, as well as ones that she had sent to friends. Again, after getting home from the festival, Liv was still upset over everything. 
So Ashley sent her a voice message to try and comfort her. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to listen to the voice messages, but I was able to find them transcribed. The voice message to Liv is as follows. He's obviously just fuming, isn't he? Because of everything, like he's taken it out on you. You tried your best over the weekend to try and keep the peace and then like obviously it's all kicked off, but you haven't done nothing wrong. Obviously, yeah, you might have been around us for what, an hour on Sunday, but like you went back to the tent, do you know what I mean? You didn't stay out with them. After that, Ashley continued texting friends about the weird things that Niall had been saying at the festival. We continued to learn more about his behavior and it was very concerning to Ashley. As we just heard, Niall had pulled out a knife and said that he wanted to stab Lee. Again, this was very, very strange behavior to Ashley. None of those men had any problems for the three years prior, so it was very bizarre to her that this feud with Sean and the man who beat him up caused such rage between Niall and Lee. I will note that I think Niall and Sean were pretty close, but we can see that clearly none of these men had much control over their temper. By July, we hear from text messages a little bit more about the feud between Lee and the other men. At this time, we can also sort of see how Ashley is becoming more and more concerned with the whole situation. By July 3rd, Ashley texted a friend named Sophie who asked Ashley, Niall is out for Lee, isn't he? There's been murder? Ashley replied, still just over the murder a few years ago when they fell out. Niall is back on his high horse. Don't know where he's popped back up from. He was in Glatso, pulled a big knife out on Ian Fitz and said, where's Lee? He's getting stabbed up. Sophie, OMG, what the hell? Is that over when he got robbed? Ashley, so like, yeah, if he's gonna do something, it's been three years. Yeah. Sophie, I don't know the full story. I just heard years ago the Hillsiders robbed him, but like, why not do something about it three years ago? Ashley then went on to explain the feud, saying, quote, Lee never took his side and they was best mates, but Niall had been bumping Lee for ages, saying he owed so much when he was putting stuff in the work, so really, he owed less and less. Used to answer all the phone, so all the running around, so Niall was taking the piss out of Lee. Ashley then told Sophie that Niall has been threatening it to come to their home. She went on to say, then he just disappeared for years and now someone's obviously rattled his cage. It's scary because he's on some pure rampage. Sophie replied, obviously Lee is with the Hillsiders, so like Niall is going to have to take them all up on his own because Sean won't back him up. Ashley, that's what Lee is saying. That's why he hasn't really done anything because he knows Lee has everyone backing him and they aren't asked. Sophie, that's just all madness. He's horrible. He used to knock me sick. Freak. After this conversation, we see that Ashley continued comforting Liv through everything that her boyfriend, Sean, was putting her through. In one voice message, she told her to just try and get through the next few days. She said that Sean would come around and if he didn't, then F him. After that, as things progressed in Lee's world with all of those gangsters that he hung around, Ashley started to express worry about her own safety. In one voice message she sent to Liv, she said, quote, had terrible anxiety yesterday, absolutely terrible anxiety. I just can't even be bothered speaking about anything. Do you know what I mean? Like, I've just thought, like, try and not speak about all the madness. By the end of July, going into August, as you can see, things were sort of heating up. To summarize for anybody confused, Niall and Lee had a falling out about three years prior due to some members of the Hillsiders stealing drugs from Niall. Lee, he is associated with the Hillsiders. After the original incident, Niall sort of fell off the radar and didn't do anything to anyone. But after the festival, it seemed that the original feud was reignited for whatever reason. At the same time, Sean was beat up by Jordan, who was a friend of Lee's. Niall and Sean were friends while Jordan and Lee were friends. But near the end of July, going into August, things got even worse. By July 21st, a mutual friend of these men named Ricky Warnick, he died by suicide after throwing himself in front of a moving train. 
this was something that heated things up even more with the friends, and I will come back to this more in just a minute. Around that same time, Liv was pretty much fed up with all of the drama between Sean and the rest of the group. So, after some time of trying to repair things, Liv did ultimately break up with Sean. By the end of July, Sean actually found out from a mutual friend that Liv's car had been parked in the driveway of Jordan Thompson, the man who apparently beat the crap out of Sean at the festival. Naturally, Sean was very, very upset by this, and it was confirmed that Liv was now seeing Jordan, who went by the nickname Dusty. So, by July 22nd, Sean messaged Niall asking, him to go and smash Liv's car. He texted him, quote, go smash the window screen now. Are you by ours? Please, bro, smash her car up. Sean sent multiple more texts after that, asking him to brick her window, saying that he would do anything for someone to smash up her car. It isn't reported whether her car was actually vandalized. If you do know that part of this case, let me know. But either way, after that, Sean sent some very, very nasty, threatening texts to Olivia. He called her things like vomit and rat, C-U-N-T. In one message, he texted her, quote, watch, your tits are getting it, gonna cut your tits off, mom's life, rat. As I stated earlier, being beat up by Jordan was very humiliating for Sean. Now, his girlfriend was dating the man who beat him up, double whammy. But beyond even that, according to text messages sent from Sean to Niall, he believed that Jordan actually bullied Ricky and caused him to take his own life. Like I said, Ricky was a friend to Niall, Lee, and Sean, but apparently he was especially close to Sean. So now, not only is Liv hanging out with someone who humiliated him, but someone who he believed bullied his friend to death. So after the death of their beloved friend, Ricky, of course, there was a funeral being planned for him. This caused Ashley to become even more worried about the rising tensions within the group. She was afraid of what would happen if Niall and Lee both attended the funeral and saw each other there. Talking about this, Ashley sent a text over to her friend, Maul. It reads, quote, Don't want to have to go to Lee's funeral next. Just had a bad, bad feeling about everything, Maul. It's horrible. Me heart's in my mouth constantly. Feel like I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. After this text, Ashley sent over a voice message to another friend named Charlotte. In the voice message, she said, quote, If my fella sees him, it's going to go off like it, yeah, it's gonna be bad, like where it's to the point where probably one of them is gonna end up in a bad way. It's scary, to be honest. Then in other messages, this time to Sophie again, she described how she was feeling drained from all of the drama. She said that she's just constantly worrying that something is going to happen. In another voice memo to Sophie, she said, quote, Is he gonna end up doing something to Lee and whatever? Like, I just couldn't cope with that. If something happens to him, because obviously Niall is effing saying he's gonna come and do something. I know if they see each other or Niall goes to his funeral, because like, Niall has just popped out of the woodwork now. Ashley went on to send another voice memo to Sophie again, saying, quote, I can just see how it's gonna pan out. It's gonna be a disaster. It's all just stress, like it's all proper doing me head in. I've got a bad, bad feeling about everything, to be honest. I just don't even know what to do, so me head's just been chaka. Like, I don't know. I'm just effing, and then she sighs. I do want to pause here and just take a note. Obviously, I am not British. I obviously don't have an accent. I don't use a lot of the same words and verbiage that people in the UK use, so if it's sounds a little bit awkward. I do apologize. I'm trying my best. I just don't know all of the slang from the UK. It took me a little bit to figure out what they were saying in some of these texts and voice memos, so if it's a little bit awkward and it doesn't quite sound right, I do apologize. I am trying my best here. Either way, after this voice message, she told Sophie that she was going to sit Lee down once and for all and make him be honest about his ties with the world of crime that he is involved with. She said that they need to speak about it properly. She needs him to tell her everything because normally she didn't even want to know. She spent most of their relationship totally in the dark about what Lee was involved with but now she felt like she had to prepare for the worst. After this, finally, the day of the funeral and wake came. 
People who went to the funeral and wake went to a bar called Ten Streets, probably for like the after dinner or a meal that happens a lot of times with funerals to celebrate that person's life. But before she got there, Ashley was told by a friend that Niall was also at the funeral. Of course, this scared Ashley. Lee told her that he would go to the wake on his own, but Ashley didn't want him to. She wanted to go with him to make sure that nothing happened. By the time Ashley arrived to the bar, she asked her friend Lois to come outside and get her. That way, she wouldn't have to walk in alone. She did that and the friends went inside while Lee waited in the car outside. I think he might have driven separately. I don't know if he was at the actual bar at the same time, but he did not go in at the same time that Ashley did. Once inside, Ashley texted Lee and told him that everybody was there, including Niall. She told Lee that she didn't think that he should come to the pub at all. So, she left the pub and met back up with Lee later. Lee and another friend apparently went off and did their own thing because they still wanted to celebrate Ricky, but they didn't want to have to be around Niall, obviously. At that point, Ashley texted a friend named Lydia to say that she was happy that Lee didn't go. In the text, she wrote in part, something was going to happen, so they done the right thing like not going but just a joke that you can't go to your own mate's funeral. After that incident, the disgusting messages from Sean to Liv continued. In one text, he wrote, you effing little rat, need to die. As she was getting those messages, Liv continued to text Ashley, who assured her that she was not at fault for Sean's behavior. All Ashley wanted to do was make her friend feel better. As you can see, a lot was happening around all of the different people involved. Things were heating up, things kept happening, and it seemed like Niall and Sean were getting more and more out of control, especially Sean. But in the three weeks that followed the funeral and wake, things seemed to calm down at least a little bit. However, Everything came to a head in the early morning hours of Sunday, August 21st, 2022. On the evening of August 20th, Ashley had been chilling at the home that she shared with Lee, lying on the couch in her pajamas with her little dog, Darla. Then by 11.40 p.m., she heard her car alarm going off. At that time, she texted her mom, the rain just set off my car alarm. A few minutes after that message, Ashley noticed that Darla was getting more and more nervous and was focusing on something outside of the house. Ashley then took a photo of herself and Darla, who was all cuddled up to her, and she sent that photo to a friend. At 11.51 p.m., she wrote to the friend, quote, any need for my child. I've never known anything like it. She is scared of something outside before in a black cat or rat. She's got me nerves gone because I'm scared of both. And now she won't leave me side like an actual baby. You can tell at that point that Ashley was at least feeling relaxed to a certain point. She didn't think that anybody was out to get her and she just thought that her dog was being adorable and scared and she was happy to provide her with comfort. Almost an hour passed after her car alarm went off and things remained calm and normal for that time. However, by 12.30 a.m., Neighbors of Ashley's heard a loud crashing sound coming from her home with the sound of screaming coming from inside. After that, the neighbor saw Ashley exiting the home and made her way into the back garden where she collapsed onto the ground. The neighbor was obviously concerned, so they immediately dialed 999. I don't have the audio of the 999 call, but according to one source, the neighbor said, quote, I've just recently heard a loud noise in the back. I've stood on my back wall and the house immediately to the back of us. There's a lady there in shorts and a t-shirt and she's groaning. She's lying in the backyard on her back. She looks like she's struggling. Minutes later, officers arrived to the home and they found a horrible scene. Inside the home, they found Darla in Ashley's bedroom, cowering in the bed which was in the corner of the bedroom. The lights and TV were still on and there were bullet holes in the walls with the floors littered with shell casings. Officers then made their way to the back of the home and there they found Ashley lying in the garden surrounded by a pool of blood. Where is the police? If there's anyone here, make yourself known! Officers with taser. Back door's open. Is 
Fifty bucks, you want to sit the lead, mate? I'm going to walk through. According to a later autopsy, the bullet had passed through her abdomen and then went through her liver and the right chamber of her heart. First responders attempted CPR and transferred her to the hospital, but unfortunately, by 1.48 a.m., she was pronounced dead. It turned out that on the night of the 20th, the suspect had slashed the tires on Ashley's car in order to set off the car alarm in hopes of luring her outside. They lied in wait outside, waiting to see if she would come out, but she didn't. So, by 12.30 a.m., the intruder kicked down the front door. Wearing a mask, the man came into the house carrying a Scorpion machine pistol, which is classified as a fully automatic pistol. That means that with just one trigger pull, multiple bullets will come out one after another. As the gunman entered Ashley's home, she screamed at them to get the F out as she ran for her life through the living room and into the dining room and then out the back door. But as she was desperately attempting to flee, the gunman was aimlessly firing 10 rounds in her direction and she was hit with one of the rounds to her abdomen, causing catastrophic damage, ultimately ending her life. After that, the gunman went upstairs and fired five more rounds into an empty bedroom. Of course, by the time police got there, the gunman was gone, and so was the gun. Of course, after finding Ashley's body and the violent scene that occurred, police started their investigation. Of course, they looked into Ashley's phone, and that is when they found all of those text messages between Ashley and all of those friends that we talked about all throughout the video. They saw this very clear picture of this feud between these rival gang members and past friends. They also discovered that after Ashley was shot, she did try calling Lee at around 12.33 a.m., but he didn't answer, so she left him a 43-second voicemail. Most likely, she was telling him that she was afraid, but to my knowledge, we don't exactly know what the voicemail said. Either way, obviously, text messages alone are not enough to prove that Sean, Niall, or Lee, or anybody else was involved in such a horrific crime. So, police relied heavily on information from the public. Turns out, police received numerous tips from many different individuals, including one witness who saw a vehicle entering the street that Ashley lived on at the same time that Ashley's tires were slashed. Then, a witness also saw a car driving fast down the road right after the time of her murder. The car was identified as a Hyundai i30N Performance. Along with the tips from witnesses, police combed through almost 2,000 hours of surveillance footage to figure out the movements of the people who could have been involved. Using the tip, police used a national registry to comb through the 1,036 cars of this type. Eventually, they narrowed it down to a Hyundai that was acquired only six days before Ashley's murder. According to CCTV footage and other evidence, Niall had driven his car, which was an Audi, and exchanged this car for a gray Hyundai i30N performance. With him, when this exchange was made, was his friend, 41-year-old James Witham. Then, they were able to find CCTV footage that showed that James and Niall were driving to a flat located in Hoyton. There, they used cell phone data to confirm that on the evening of the 20th, the night before Ashley was murdered, Niall, James, Sean, and another man, 29-year-old Joseph Pierce, were all together at the flat in Hoyton the flat turned out to be where Niall lived. The same car that was seen near Ashley's flat just before and after the murder was also seen on CCTV footage heading to Niall's flat that night and then driving away right before Ashley's murder. I will come back to these other two men, Joseph and James, in just a few minutes. In addition to the witness statements, CCTV footage, as well as cell phone data, police were also able to collect tons of forensic evidence from the scene as well. Police actually found that James left DNA on a gun cartridge that was found at the scene. 
In addition to that, police found that James had just purchased a pair of on-cloud gym shoes less than two days before Ashley's murder. Well, they found a shoe print that exactly matched James' shoe at the scene. To police, this said that James was the one who kicked down the door and fired as many as 15 rounds into the home. Now, of course, during the investigation, police first brought Ashley's boyfriend, Lee, into the station to question him about what he knew about that night. It seemed very convenient that he happened not to be home when some violent offender broke into the home and gunned Ashley down. When questioned, Lee said that on the night of the shooting, Lee had been in a taxi on his way to a party. As he was heading there, he did see police tape on his street, but he continued to the party anyways. At that point, police were pretty certain that Niall and Sean, at the very least, could have had something to do with it. So police brought that up to Lee, and he said that he had no idea why him or Ashley would have been targeted. He claimed that there were no issues with the group. He said that he didn't think that Niall was capable of killing Ashley, even referring to Niall as an old friend. According to police, Lee was very uncooperative and refused to answer any further questions about the shooting. He said that he didn't think that there was any threat to himself or his or Ashley's family. That is all he was willing to say. Police went on to describe Lee as nonchalant and unhelpful with the investigation into the death of his own girlfriend, which is very, very disturbing and cold behavior from Lee. You would think that he would want to do anything and everything he can to try to figure out what happened to his beloved girlfriend, but he wasn't cooperating at all. At this point, police felt that they had enough to at least take Sean and Niall into the station. When looking into the whereabouts of Niall, they actually found out that he was in the middle of attempting to leave the country. It turned out that the day after the shooting, Niall had made contact with someone in his phone whose name was saved as Gus. Gus has actually never been identified even by police to this day. Either way, they found text messages that showed that by 3.09 p.m. on August 22nd, he sent a text to Gus, which was followed by Gus calling him immediately. After that, they had a text exchange, which reads as follows. Gus, sound, I'll speak, kid. Tell him need on next one and drop ye F or AMS. Police believe that F means France and AMS is Amsterdam. After that, they talked about pickup and drop off with Gus telling Niall that he needed to only travel with a kit bag. After that, Niall called Sean, which police believe is Niall telling Sean about his plans to leave the country. By August 23rd at 5.43 a.m., Gus texted Niall, have info today, what's what, bro? The following morning, Niall texted Gus, okay son, nice one, thank you. On the night of August 24th, Niall was seen on CCTV footage traveling to the Formby Hall Golf and Spa Resort by taxi. There, he met his girlfriend, Lucy, who drove separately. By that point, police felt that it was now or never. They had to arrest him before he got the chance to leave. Police felt that him being at this hotel with his girlfriend was so that they could have one final night together before he left and started a new life elsewhere. By 10.45 p.m. on August 24th, police arrived to the hotel and arrested him. Upon searching his room, police found 10,250 pounds or 12,953 U.S. dollars as well as his passport. Just as he had been instructed, Niall was traveling light. That's below the threshold. Oh, hello, Mr. Niall. Yeah, that'll do. That'll come in. I think that was it, to be fair. Niall, time is 25 2, mate. You're going to be arrested of, under suspicion of possession of that, okay? That's, is it? That's not my bag. It's in your bag with your passport in it, okay? Yeah, you, I, I've just showed that to you before, my passport was in this bag. Uh, so, yeah. do you have to say anything about me? I'm in defence, do not mention any questions, think you later on in court, anything you do say may be given in evidence, all right? That's not my bag. It's got your passport in it. Ask him, he grabbed all my stuff before. Hmm? Ask him, he grabbed all my stuff before. Is it just one bag? 
No, there's, no, there's my two bag, bags. My bag, my bag, the carrier bag, the white bag. With all, with all the clothes in. He did say straight away that his passport's going to be in his mate's bag. I did say that, yeah, I did say that. I still want to show the You're under arrest for now, okay? After being taken into the station, according to police, Niall actually gave some information, but he was very vague and refused to answer most police questions. He told police that he spent most of the evening on the 21st watching a UFC fight at his flat with his friends Sean and then a man named Michael Kershaw and another friend Ian Fitzgibbon. At the time, police were also able to locate Sean, and he too was arrested. After the arrest of Sean, police uncovered some very disturbing messages between Sean and Niall that uncovered even more criminal activity that they were involved with. Both Sean and Niall had been using a communication service called EncroChat. EncroChat is a Europe-based communications network that offers modified smartphones with encrypted communication among users. Of course, it is mostly used by those involved in organized crime. One source reported that French officials hacked the EncroChat servers and were able to obtain access to information of the users. This uncovered that Niall used the service under the name Better Trunk, while Sean was known as Frosty Socks. Using messages uncovered on the app, it turned out that both Sean and Niall were a part of an organized crime group that were supplying massive amounts of hard drugs. In the first half of 2020, Niall, or Better Trunk, sold 40 kilos of cocaine, half a kilo of heroin, 28 kilos of cannabis, one kilo of ketamine, and one kilo of amphetamines. According to police officers, these drugs were worth about 1.5 million pounds, and from that, Niall made a profit of 100,000 pounds in a very short amount of time. Meanwhile, Sean, aka Frosty Socks, supplied 15 kilos of cocaine, 6 kilos of heroin, 13 kilos of cannabis, and 2 kilos of ketamine. This was estimated to be about 680,000 pounds worth of drugs. Using the information gathered from the chats as well as other witnesses in investigation, they found that Sean and Niall were supplying mostly heroin and crack cocaine in the North Wales area. The two used burner phones to contact each other and others involved in organized crime to make deliveries and use others to make contacts. In total, it's believed that they had over 165 customers and that their stuff was known as being some of the best in the area. Also on EncroChat, police found messages which they believed were them obtaining a plethora of different firearms. Back in April of 2020, there were messages between Niall and Sean, where Niall told Sean to get a 380 pistol from another user. Then, later in April, he messages a different user, this time to obtain a bunch of different firearms, including an AK-47, a Tech-9, a Grand Power with a suppressor, a Star-9, a Walther PP handgun, as well as a Scorpion machine gun. From this, police saw that clearly they had access to many guns. Not only that, but they did have possession of the same type of gun that murdered Ashley Dale. Police felt that at this point, they had plenty to show that Niall and Sean were not only involved with organized crime, but they were shown on CCTV footage to be at Niall's home with a bunch of other men on the night of the crime, and they had access to the same type of gun that killed Ashley. But like I mentioned earlier, James Witham was the one who got the car that was seen on CCTV footage, and his DNA and shoe print were at the actual scene of the crime. With him when he got the car was his friend Joseph Pierce. So, police arrested both Joseph and James as well. Hello, mate. How are you doing? I'm going to put you in cuffs, mate. All right. What's your name, fella? Francis. Say that again. Francis Kelly. Gary. Francis. Gary Francis. Francis Kelly. Francis Gary. Francis right. Kelly. K Carrie. Kelly. Francis. Kelly. It's all right. My ears, your... Right, we'll walk over here, fella. You got anything on you you shouldn't? No. Anything in the vehicle that you shouldn't be? 
Yeah, James. 100%. Right, okay, you're under arrest for a suspicion of murder. All right, you don't have to say anything. The main army defence, you don't mention one question, something which will let in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. All right. Open the windows. Open the door. All right, lads, keep your hands where you can see them. Just keep your hands where you can see them, pal. Can put you in some handcuffs. Yeah, what about that side? Just need to drive around that side. Yeah, no bother. Just off the door for us, mate. Until we confirm your identity, we'll put you in handcuffs. What's your name, fella? Eh? Joseph. Tom's just getting dry brow and all three will disappear. Arrest on suspicion of murder. Okay. You don't have to say anything. I am a defence, you don't mention one question. Some people should later rely on in court. And it's just in the car, um, you know, me. Suspicion of murder. After arresting James, he was confronted with all of the damning evidence that they had against him, and pretty quickly, he broke. But he had many, many different stories about what he claimed happened, and it was clear to police that he was lying. After arresting James, he was confronted with all of the damning evidence that they had against him, and pretty quickly, he broke. But he had many, many different stories about what he claimed happened, and it was clear to police that he was lying. First, he told police that him and his buddy were all at Niall's house watching the UFC fight on the night of Ashley's murder. He said that he had been smoking weed and consuming cocaine for days at that point, and by that night, he hadn't slept in several days. He said that he asked the group to get more cocaine, but no one else wanted to do more drugs other than him. So, he decided to go out and get some, taking Joseph along with him. But as they were driving, James went the wrong direction. He started heading towards Ashley's house. It was at that point that he said he wanted to go to Lee's home and sent a message to Lee. Joseph said that he was not a willing participant in all of this. He was dragged along. When they got to the flat in a drug-fueled craze, he busted into her flat and shot aimlessly into the home. James claimed that he did not see Ashley in there at all. He didn't chase her down with the gun or anything. He thought that nobody was home. So, he continued shooting into the home before going up to the bedroom and shooting five rounds into the room. He said that he was sending a message to Lee that if he had been home, he would be dead and that they wanted him dead. James said that he returned back to Niall's flat and told everybody about everything. He said that both Sean and Niall were shocked and horrified at what he had done. He said that they wanted nothing to do with the situation and at no point did they want Lee dead. However, the story continued to change after that because nobody believed it. Based on everything they found, police believed that Niall and Sean had been planning to murder Lee for a long time, that they planned the entire thing from Niall's flat. They then got James and Joseph involved. Most likely, those men were also involved in organized crime with Niall and Sean. Again, we know that there were rising tensions between Niall, Sean, and Lee. They were all feuding and mad at each other, so they believed that this is why they wanted Lee dead. So, they sent James and Joseph off to murder Lee, knowing that police would immediately suspect Niall and Sean. What better way to cover for what they did than to not be at the scene and leave no evidence of themselves behind? At the scene, as we know, the men slashed Ashley's tires to lure Lee outside, but that didn't work. So, wearing a mask to cover his face, James kicked the door in and started shooting. Every time that James told his side of the story, he claimed that he did not see Ashley inside of the home. He thought that nobody was home, so he put bullets all around the home to send a message. However, as we would later find out in the trial, ballistics taken from the scene show that the shooter was following Ashley, getting closer and closer to her as she ran away. So, it does appear that the shooter saw her and was targeting her. Why? we still don't fully know. Then, James went up to the bedroom once again to shoot it up and send a message. After that, they fled in the Hyundai and put a fake license plate on the car to cover it up. 
Then they parked the car in a driveway of a property in St. Helens to hide the car. A week after that, James and Sean then moved the car to another driveway in St. Helens. The car was not discovered until October 9th, a month and a half after the murder. So, based on all of the information that I have discussed up to this point, police charged 41-year-old James Witham with murder, and eventually, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter. However, all four men, including 28-year-old Sean Zeese, 26-year-old Niall Barry, 29-year-old Joseph Pierce, and James Witham were charged with conspiracy to commit the murder of Lee Harrison and the murder of of Ashley Dale. They were also charged with conspiracy to possess a dangerous weapon with the intent to endanger life. Separately, in another trial, Niall and Sean were also charged with drug-related offenses, which they both pled guilty to. One of the friends that I mentioned earlier, who was also at the home on the night of the murder, Ian Fitzgibbon, as well as another associate of these men, Callum Radford, were also charged with conspiracy charges, but they were eventually found to not be involved with the murder. After these charges, Sean, Niall, James, and Joseph were all tried together. Their trial took place in November of 2023. In the trial, they discussed the feud that started it all at the music festival. They brought forward all of those messages between Ashley and various friends, all of which outlined how bad the feud was, how she was scared for Lee and her own safety, knowing the lengths that some of these people could go to. They talked about all of the forensic evidence, the CCTV footage, the text messages, cell phone data, as well as the EncroChat data. They argued that this feud started it all, that Niall and Sean wanted revenge on Lee for everything that happened with the drugs, Sean's ex-girlfriend, and everything. Then, when their beloved friend Rick he died, that just reignited the hate flame. They said that Niall was the ringleader in all of this. He had plentiful access to drugs and guns. He was the one who orchestrated this entire thing. They brought forward various witnesses who could vouch for the tensions between the group, including Ian, who witnessed the thing with Niall pulling out the knife and saying that he wanted to stab Lee at the music festival. At the trial, after hearing all of the evidence, everything that we discussed, which as we know by now, was pretty extensive and exhaustive, the jury was sent off for deliberations. And by November 20th, the jury found that all four men are guilty for murdering Ashley, the conspiracy to kill Lee, as well as the firearm possession charges. For these charges, 28-year-old Sean was given a life sentence with a minimum of 42 years served, Niall was sentenced to life with a minimum of 47 years, Joseph was given life with a minimum of 41 years, and James was given life with a minimum of 43 years. At 11.40, p.m. on the 20th of August last year, a Hyundai car drove into Leinster Road in Old Swan, Liverpool. Inside were two men, James Witham and Joseph Piers. They drove there as a result of a criminal agreement with Niall Barry and Sean Zeiss to kill the occupants of 40 Leinster Road using a Scorpion submachine gun. They each knew that Lee Harrison lived there with his partner, Ashley Dale. It was their home. The car had been acquired in the days leading up to what happened, with false number plates ready to use when the hiding of the car followed. In an attempt to bring the occupants out of the house, Witham and Piers stabbed the car tyres of the car parked outside. That set off the car alarm. Inside the house was Ashley Dale in her pyjamas watching television. When she heard the alarm, she believed it was caused by heavy rain and so she stayed inside. Outside, Witham and Piers waited for their moment for this planned killing. What followed was a murder of such seriousness that it has shocked both the local community and many in this country. The use of a military-grade submachine gun to kill a young woman in her own home at night in a planned shooting of the occupants of that house is beyond any understanding. After the shooting, Witham and Piers drove away. The car was parked elsewhere, out of view, and later that day to be hidden on the driveway of a property in St Helens, 
A week later, it was driven by Piers and Zeiss to be hidden on another driveway in St Helens until it was discovered by the police on the 9th of October. Ashley Dale died very shortly after she was shot. <coughs> Lee Harrison has refused to cooperate in the police investigation into her murder. So involved with criminal drug dealing gangs is he. For the family of Ashley Dale, this must have been a cruel twist to the tragic loss of their daughter and sister. Not only was she brutally killed in her own home, but Lee Harrison has refused to assist the police to bring her killers to justice. This murder and the criminal conspiracies to murder and to possess the prohibited firearm and ammunition were planned by the four of you. The motive concerned a deep-seated drugs feud between Barry and Lee Harrison, who was also associated with a drugs criminal group called the Hillsiders, dealing in kilo quantities of Class A and B drugs and with access to guns. Barry also had access to guns, particularly military-grade Scorpion submachine guns. Witham, Zeiss and Piers were part of the gang with Barry and in violent competition with the Hillsiders, one of whom discharged a firearm in public and threatened Zeiss. I'm sure on the evidence that Barry and Witham played the lead roles in this murder, which was discussed and carried out from Barry's flat at 267 Pilch Lane in Highton. Barry directing and providing the gun and ammunition whilst Witham agreed to carry out the shooting with Piers assisting Witham driving in the car to the scene. In the days that followed, Barry planned to leave the country but was arrested before he could do so. Witham and Piers stayed in a hotel in St Helens, away from their homes in Liverpool and also stayed in Scotland before they were arrested. Upon the arrest of Barry and Zeiss, evidence was also discovered of other offences by them amounting to very serious organised crime. It was revealed in EncroChat conversations in which both Barry and Zeiss were part of a conspiracy to supply large quantities of illicit drugs over a six-month period in 2020 in both the north and south of this country. In sentencing the defendants and assessing their culpability for counts one to three, murder, conspiracy to murder, and conspiracy to possess a prohibited weapon and ammunition with intent to endanger life. I am satisfied that Witham and Barry must be treated as equally the most culpable. Witham carried out the shooting, and it was Barry who provided the gun with the ammunition and was the protagonist in the planning. He had the greatest motive and had threatened violence to Lee Harrison previously. Piers assisted Witham in the shooting, and Zeiss actively and intentionally encouraged the shooting. The sentence for the murder of Ashley Dale, count one, must be imprisonment for life for each of you. I am required to fix the minimum term that must be served in custody before any of you may seek to release, seek a release on licence, which will be decided on whether you remain a danger to the public, as I find that you currently do. I return now to the minimum term to be served as part of the sentence of imprisonment for life for the murder of Ashley Dale. I sentence each of you to imprisonment for life on count one for the murder of Ashley Dale. Niall Barry on count one, murder. Your minimum term is increased to 35 years but must be further increased to reflect your offending in counts two, three and in the second indictment. Your minimum term is 47 years, less 433 days served on remand. James Witham on count one, murder, your minimum term is also increased to 35 years, but must be further incre increased to reflect your offending on counts two and three. Your minimum term is 43 years, less 295 days served on remand. Joseph Pears on count one, murder, your minimum term is increased to 33 years, but must be further increased to reflect your offending in counts two and three. Your minimum term is 41 years, less 295 days served on remand. Sean Zeiss, on count one murder, your minimum term is increased to 32 years, but must be further increased to reflect your offending in counts two and three and the second indictment. Your minimum term is 42 years, less 448 days served on remand. After these men were convicted, Obviously, Ashley's family was happy to finally have some closure in this big mess of a case. 
There are so many moving parts, so, so many people involved, and so much going on. But at the end of it all, they are left with a massive hole. The family said that Lee isn't even who Ashley wanted to end up with, but she stuck around and she was murdered because she fell in love with the wrong person. And to add to that, after it all, Lee was uncooperative. He was unpleasant. He offered absolutely no help with anything. Most likely, in my opinion, it's probably because of the organized crime that he is involved with. He doesn't want to be seen as a snitch or something like that. But even so, Ashley's family felt that his lack of cooperation was a huge slap in the face after everything that happened. Then, to add to that, their other son was also killed under almost these same circumstances. Lewis was murdered by gang members who mistook him for someone else. Ashley was murdered by gang members who thought that Lee would be home. It makes absolutely no sense. It's just horrific and senseless and my heart absolutely goes out to the family because I know that they are going through it. But that is all of the information that I have on today's case. I know it was a wild one. I know that there was a hell of a lot going on, but I am happy that we got to discuss this one. It's just so terrifying to hear of two young lives lost because of mistaken identity. And the fact that Ashley lived her life in fear before she was murdered, that just makes everything that much more awful. But that is all I have for today's video and now I want to hear what you all think. Do you believe James when he says that he didn't know Ashley was there? Or do you think he killed her to send a message to Lee? I think that it was to send a message to Lee. Why do you think this feud caused such a stir within these gang members after three years of being chill with each other? What do you think of Lee's lack of cooperation? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.